Good morning. Today on Spotlight, the life and times of Dave Bing, NBA Hall of Famer, one of the 50 greatest to ever play the game, successful businessman, former Detroit mayor, and high-profile mentor. He has put his story into a new book called Dave Bing Attacking the Rim with TV Le Cicero. It's Sunday, November the 15th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Uh, let's start with the sport. Uh, you grew up in Washington, D.C., grew up in what you refer to as a poor neighborhood. Uh, but it seems as though there were some things that you got from both of your parents. Uh, you came from a, a family unit that was always together there. Uh, church was important. Education was important. And those were always emphasized to you as sort of your guiding light. Um, those seem to have been principles that stayed with you throughout your entire career, no matter what it was you were doing that kept you sort of grounded. Am I correct about that? You're absolutely correct. I was very fortunate to have, uh, you know, the two parents and a great family structure. But the community and the neighborhood that I lived in was also important because there were always somebody there to give you the helping hand, to give you the guidance, to tell you when you were off track, when you're doing something wrong, and they would tell you, okay, you got to get back to this. So when I looked at uh, my young life, you know, my dad uh, was without a doubt um, a key, a key person in my life. And then I moved to high school. My basketball coach at high school was like a surrogate father to me and my teammates. And uh, he always talked about, um, don't worry about being a star. You got to be a good team player. You got to be a leader. And it's not how many points you score, but it's how you make sure that everybody gets involved into the game. So uh, I've always um, given the, the courtesy and the respect uh, to, to my coach for instilling that in me. And, you know, as I left high school, uh, as an All-American high school player, and it was time for me to go to college, my parents couldn't afford to send me to college. Um, fortunately, I got a, a, a sports scholarship uh, at Syracuse. and. <laughs> People ask me, why in the hell did you go to Syracuse? They lost 27 <laughs> games in a row. Yeah, because it's here, cold uh, in Syracuse. <laughs> here, here you are, one of the top high, five high school players in the country, and you go to a, a school that's a football school. Well, it was, and, and, you know, I was so impressed as a senior in high school getting recruited by Ernie Davis, the first African-American to win the Heisman Trophy, and John Mackey, the all-pro in, uh, you know, for Baltimore. And those are the two guys. We had no black players in the basketball team. And so one other uh, African-American from uh, New York City had already committed to Syracuse. And so I decided uh, after my weekend visit with Ernie and, and John to, uh, to go to Syracuse. And it was the right choice for me. Dave, I think uh, one thing that I took away, and I want to know your answer to it, how did you overcome an eye injury at a very early age uh, when you were a kid, and then later when you were actually playing, you had another eye injury, um, to become a Hall of Famer, a standout at Spingard High School, uh, an All-American at Syracuse, uh, most valuable player in an All-Star game. How did you overcome that kind of physical thing and didn't even realize, I guess, for a while there that you actually had some damage done there? Yeah, at five years old, um, I have a nail that hit me in my left eye. And, you know, I came from a family that we had no, no insurance. Um, so we thought it was just a bruise. Um, and, and so we didn't pay a lot of attention to it. But um, over a period of time, uh, you know, I couldn't see out that eye. I could see the light, but I couldn't see anything else. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm trying to deal with um, that challenge of having uh, one eye that I, I couldn't see out of. And I was a baseball player before basketball. And as a right-handed hitter, my lead eye was my left eye, and I couldn't see out of that. So I did play baseball all the way through high school. But I, I, I started playing basketball at the age of about 12 or 13. And basketball took over um, my athletic uh, career. 
And so from five years old until now, um, I still can't really see out of my left eye. But uh, I've overcome that challenge and I've had a lot of success uh, from a sports standpoint, uh, even though that was a hell of a challenge for me. Yeah. Uh, real quick, before we go to the break, uh, you had all kind of trophies, all kind of success uh, on the court. Uh, you never got that NBA ring, did you? Never got the NBA ring. I'll tell you, I, the only championship team I played on was my high school team. And my coach said to me way back then, you need to, you need to honor and cherish this because as you go to college and maybe get into the pro levels, it's very, very difficult to be on a championship team. And that, that was so true, but I can cherish the time in high school and what it was like playing on a championship team. All right. We're going to, you had just about everything else, though, so that's not bad. <laughs> we're going <take, laughs> to take a little break. We'll come right back with some more questions to NBA legend and businessman Dave Bing. Stay with us. And welcome back to Spotlight. We're talking to Dave Bing. Uh, he has a new book out, Dave Bing with TV Le Cicero. It's called Attacking the Rim. Uh, Dave, I was struck by the fact that at Syracuse, early in your career at Syracuse, um, uh, you ended up having a baby. Uh, you yeah. got married at an early age. Uh, yeah. Then you had another baby. You were focused on being able to achieve all the things you did athletically, and you were an economics major, so you weren't taking basket weaving courses at Syracuse. How <laughs> in the world did you do all of those things um, with all of those responsibilities at such a young age? Well, um, contrary to what a lot of people may think, coming from a public high school, uh, actually, from the kindergarten through the 12th grade, um, everybody uh, in my school system looked like me. I never went to school with, uh, with, with somebody that wasn't black. Um, and, you know, by the time I got to Syracuse, um, Syracuse had 14,000 undergraduate students. And out of the 14,000, we had 100 African Americans, 80 males and 20 girls. Um, so from a socialization standpoint, uh, things was tough. And coming up and growing up in DC, women, girls um, were eight to one. Uh, and so you had a lot of choices when you were growing up as far as you know dating and doing whatever. When I got to Syracuse, it was 100% different. And uh, so I, I came home in my freshman year uh, for Thanksgiving, and my girlfriend from high school um, got pregnant. And so my old my my parents are very old fashioned. You know, you 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 did this, and you don't have a choice. You got to get married. And so as a freshman, uh, I got married, and and had a child my freshman year. Um, academically, I was a pretty good student. So I had to focus on both academics, um, you know, taking care of, of, a, of a child um, and a wife and, and still trying to be productive on the basketball court. It was not easy, but it worked out well. And once again, I had great support from uh, her family and my family. So she finished high school and moved up to Syracuse with me in my senior year. And then uh, she was pregnant again, and we had our second child, um, another little girl, uh, in my senior year. So um, uh, those were good years for me. I mean, I enjoyed the experience at Syracuse because it, it exposed me to a different kind of world. All of a sudden, I was around a lot of rich white kids. As you look back on your business career and the Bing Steel Company that you built and becoming one of the key African-American entrepreneurs in the country and being honored by the president and other people, uh, what are you most proud of? I was proud of the business career more so than my athletic career because I had a direct impact on the livelihood of a lot of different people. 
We started uh, Bing Steel in, in 1980 with four people, including myself. And after 28 years uh, in the business, uh, we had grown to about 1,400 people. Um, and most of my employees were uh, Detroiters, which means they were African American. And so you can look at uh, a, minority, a minority ownership, but never get and have an impact on the community uh, that you live in. I think we had a major positive impact because um, I have a payroll that averaged somewhere between 45 to $50 million a year. So the automotive industry was good to us uh, early on as we were, we were going through this growth spurt. And by the end of uh, my career, um, back in 207, uh, uh, 208, is when the automotive industry started to hit the bottom. And then they could no longer support a lot of the suppliers that were out here. They wanted me, I was big enough in their minds that I should probably uh, go have a plant in Mexico, maybe have a plant in China. But uh, the profit margins were very, very thin. So you never built up the equity that was necessary to, to leave the United States. So in 2008, uh, not only was the automotive industry in trouble, the banking industry had all kinds of problems, the housing industry had all kinds of problems. And I said, well, at 64 years old, it's probably time for me to get out of this. So we started uh, looking at trying to sell the company. And it took us a while, but the biggest problem I had is that in selling the company, I didn't know what was going to happen to my employees who had helped me grow. And uh, I probably stayed uh, a year or maybe two years longer than I should have because uh, I personally lost a lot of money in that time frame. But it was more important to me to make sure that my folks were taken care of and not, not to worry about myself so much. All right, we need to take another quick little break, a little pause for the cause. We'll come back and we'll talk about the, those years where you were chief executive of the city of Detroit. We'll be right back. Mr. Mayor, you talk about the years in your book about when you were uh, the chief executive of this city. Uh, looking back on that, was it something you'd do all over again? I've been asked that question on several different occasions, and as tough as it was, my answer is yes, because the need and the challenges were so great. Um, that, that time in my life, um, I surely wasn't looking to run for mayor. Number one, I didn't live in the city. Right. And so in, in order to run for mayor, I had to move back into the city. And uh, my wife, um, who's a Detroiter, um, wasn't ready to move back into the city. And she wasn't exactly sure um, what I was going to do. The tough thing for me was uh, the risk of running uh, in a political arena. Because over the 50 years that I had been here, I had built up a lot of goodwill, um, not only as a basketball player, a community activist, uh, but, uh, but also as an entrepreneur creating jobs for people. And so, you know, you go into the next career, uh, politics, and you're very lucky if you get 51% of the people that are going to support you. That was a tough time for the city because coming in after Kwame, who I thought was just a, a, a tremendous talent. Uh, I supported him in both of his terms. I knew his mother and dad very well. And, uh, you know, he was an outstanding young man. And then when we started hearing all of the negative things about what he was doing and what was going on, it was tough for me to go to him and say, uh, you know, Rukwama, you probably need to leave the office because uh, you're losing support in the city um, and, and, and nobody's going to make any investments because the trust isn't there anymore. And so as we put a committee together to try to figure out who would take his place, um, you know, it never crossed my mind that I was going to be the one to take his place. Be careful and, what you ask for. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. When I had a chance to really go over um, the financial situation that we were up against and found out we were $18 billion, billion dollars in debt and long-term liabilities. 
and the tax base in the city uh, was was going the wrong way because people were leaving the city. We had a lot of great people in city government who cared about the city, who cared about services uh, provided for the businesses and the, and the community at large. So I lucked up and uh, had a lot of good folks. And, I, and from the outside, I, I was able to get and attract some, some very talented people. It, that wasn't easy because, you know, you, you don't make much money. And, and in my case, I said, I'm going to do this without taking a salary at all because I didn't want people to think I was doing this to try to make money. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, it cost me money. I had to, I had to uh, leave three different public boards that I was on. That was, I was getting maybe $150,000 a month, uh, not a month, but a year. Um, and then I had to move in Detroit, which cost me money. And I had to furnish a, an apartment and a condo and took no salary. So from a financial standpoint, I took a big hit but it was worth it. It wasn't about me. It was about trying to save this city and bring it back to prominence. And do you feel like you did a lot because of your own integrity and the people that you brought in that you helped to build that trust back up, uh, trust in government, trust in people, trust in leaders? Absolutely, no doubt about it. That was the biggest challenge that we had. And so we had to overcome that. And by the third year in office, it was obvious to me that uh, we were a city that was going to have to file bankruptcy. And uh, there was no way with the tax base that we had, we were going to be able, be able to supply the services necessary for the folks here. But I would tell you the luck of having uh, President Obama in office was um, like a silver coin for me because I knew him um, and he trusted me and he supported the city between the Department of Transportation, between HUD, between the Department of Education. They were very, very supportive of the city. And without that, we would have filed bankruptcy much sooner. So um, I, we didn't get the support that I think we should have gotten from the state. Uh, as a matter of, matter of fact, I think the state worked against the city mm -hmm. and, um, and they finally made a decision that they were going to bring in an emergency manager. And so that was a bitter pill to swallow, but I knew it, I couldn't fight that. Um, you could fight it, but that was a losing battle. Um, the emergency manager, when he came in, Kevin Orr, he and I got along pretty good. We said, we're not going to fight each other. He says, you run the city. I don't know anything about the city. My job is to fix the finances in the city. And Kevin did a good job as far as I'm concerned, uh, but he had the support uh, of Lansing behind him, which I don't think I ever had. All right, we need to take uh, one more final break. We'll come right back and we'll talk about this uh, mentorship program that you've been so involved in. We'll be right back with Dave Bing. Stay with us. You said, I want to devote the time that I have left to the youth of this community. Why has that been such a passion for you? I was at one of your events, uh, and it was just a stellar event. And you can look at those young men's faces and tell that what they were getting from your organization, Bingo, uh, was life-changing. I look at those boys, um, and that was me when I was their age. Um, a lot of, unfortunately, the, the, the family uh, breakdown is, is tough. You got more women leading the households uh, in this country uh, than you do a family structure. And the women do a significant job, but these boys need a man in their lives. And, and, and in my life, all the way, I've had men that, uh, that I looked at as role models. A lot of our boys today just don't have positive role models. And so all they hear are the negative things that, and people tell them what they can't achieve. And so um, I've been blessed with good health for the most part. Uh, I've been blessed with success in life. And um, I wanted to be able to get a hold of some of these young men and let them know positive things. The toughest thing uh, for me um, when I, Bob and I decided to start this program was that we had a, an amazing amount of boys that needed help. 
but there were not a lot of black men that I could find that were make the, that would make the commitment to be a mentor. So we started with 40 boys six years ago. We asked a lot of these mentors um, in terms of their time and commitment. Uh, what, they have to stay with uh, the boy a minimum of a year. And our retention rate from six years is 93%. These mentors have stayed with these boys and uh, in some cases taken on another. So I am deeply appreciative to what they're doing. Too often, um, you know, we don't take care of our own. And we've been very fortunate. We've had, we were over 100 boys at this time, and each boy is, is matched up with a man. Uh, from a graduation standpoint, uh, a lot of our boys who started in the ninth grade in high school, 50% of them don't graduate. Now, we have 100% graduation rate with our boys. So we've got over 30 plus boys that's coming out program and have graduated and 80% of them are now in college. And we're telling them, if this program helped you, we want you to come back and be a part of the program and be a mentor. And that's starting to happen. Uh, our funders have been absolutely wonderful in supporting us. Uh, and now we're going to try to expand a little bit and get a few more men uh, to come in and help us as we grow this program. But uh, this, without a doubt, um, out of the four careers that I've had, uh, is the one that makes me feel the best because I can see day in and day out the impact that we're having on the lives of our young men. Dave Bing, I am so glad uh, that your good friend and business partner, Bob Warfield, nudged you enough to sit down and write this book and put your life on paper. Uh, it's a fascinating account of an individual's rise from, um, from very humble beginnings to a very rewarding and successful career. It's a good read with the holidays coming up. I would encourage people to get out there and pick up a copy and uh, make sure that you pass it along to each other. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and sharing this. And once again, the book is called Dave Bing, Attacking the Rim, life story of an NBA legend. Thank you so much. Good talking to you and uh, stay thank safe you. until Bob stays safe as well. Will do. Thank you so much, Chuck. That's it for today. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.